It is February 26th, 2015. I am Nancy Becker at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. I am with Carol Kronheim, former Acting Secretary of State, former Deputy Director of Policy and Planning in the Whitman Administration. We are here to continue our series of conversations on the Whitman Administration for the Center on the American Governor. Let's start this afternoon, Carol, by asking you to tell us about yourself. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to college? Okay, well, I was born in Long Branch in Monmouth County, and uh, my folks uh, have bought, built themselves a little house in Deal. My mom grew up in Deal and went to Asbury Park High School. My dad went to a Newark Academy in Newark. And uh, when I was about three, though, they moved up to Short Hills in the winter, and I wound up going to Kent Place in Summit, which is an all-girls uh, prep school. Um, now it's the only non-religious girls' school in, the school in the state, very interested in uh, leadership and other things. And I was there from nursery school through senior year. And from there, I went to Princeton University and majored in classics, so I studied ancient uh, Greek and Latin. Interesting. So tell us a little bit about your family. Well, uh, my all, all New Jerseyan, been here uh, a long time. <laughs> I have uh, three siblings, and I'm the youngest. I have a brother and, and two older sisters. So I'm going to go back to your education for a minute because I understand that you are a fairly recently minted, minted PhD. So oh, yeah. finish <laughs> your graduate school education. Okay. Well. Uh, after Princeton, I went to work, and then I came back and did my master's degree here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and I got a master's in politics and graduated in 93, and it was a, a wonderful experience. And uh, then 10 years later, I started school again. I started school in 82, 92, and 2002. Um, it was the end of the Whitman administration, and uh, Cliff Zukin, who had been one of my professors at Eagleton, said that the Blaustein School was looking for a guinea pig public policy student who wasn't a planner because the planning school was broadening to a planning and public policy school. So I went to Blaustein and uh, worked on my PhD and finished in 2011. So I'm a young alum. Young <laughs> alum. And your family now? Uh, I am uh, married uh, to uh, Bill Flayhive, who is an attorney uh, out of Lambertville and who uh, we met working for Governor Kane. He was also in the AG's office for a number of years. And I have two sons. I have a 17-year-old, Sean, and a 14-year-old, Kevin. So. so what was your first interest in politics? Almost, well, very first was probably Mills and Fenwick. I'd have to be honest. I, my parents moved when I was just starting high school from Short Hills to Somerset County to watch them. And of course, Somerset County is Mills and Fenwick's stomping grounds. And uh, having gone to Kent Place, too, and, uh, you know, an all-girls school experience, um, she was really uh, well-regarded and had spoken at our school and was well-known. And uh, also, Governor Kane uh, campaign in, in 81, a lot of people in my school were involved, a lot of their parents were involved. Uh, so when I was old enough to, uh, to vote, I, I registered to vote, and my I registered as a Republican so I could vote for Millicent Fenwick against Jeff Bell in the uh, primary in 82. And I was pleased that she, she won the primary, and unfortunately she didn't win the general election. But that was probably the beginning. And then I put it out of my mind in college, because I was studying uh, Latin and, and Greek. Uh, I did take uh, Roman history, though, and Greek history, and there's a lot of politics involved and all that, a lot of emperors and other things. And uh, my... Uh, career path took me uh, to Governor Kane's office at when I graduated, and, and it was sort of a fluke. I had a friend who'd worked there and was going on to law school, and he said, hey, there's an opening. You should apply for this. And when I first decided to major in classics, one of the things that, that, that clinched it for me was they said, oh, we have a young woman who graduated last year, and she's a speechwriter for Governor Kane. I remember it was Catherine Brokaw. She's a speechwriter for Governor Kane, and I said, oh, that sounds cool. But then I put it completely out of my head and did not think about it. I had applied for a job teaching Latin and got that job the same week I got the job in Governor Kane's office. I was going to teach uh, Latin at a prep school for prep school. And uh, uh, I wound up taking the job in politics and figured I'd teach in a year or so. And I never went back to teaching Latin. 
That's great. So I'm going to jump ahead uh, <laughs> to the Whitman uh, campaign. And were you involved in her camp in her campaign either for the Senate or when she uh, first ran for governor? No, when she ran for the Senate, I was living in Washington D.C. I had had the uh, at the end of the Kane administration, I got from the governor's office to Jane Burgio's office, which was a a great honor and uh, privilege and pleasure for me. And I'd worked for her assistant secretary of state, Al Felsenberg. And Al got a job at the National Endowment for the Arts and brought one or two of us down with him to the NEA. So I was living in DC, and but I followed that race that night. I had, I had voted for her. I'd voted absentee, and I'd followed that race very closely and was very uh, excited about the outcome. Even though I have to admit that I voted for Bill Bradley in 84 because of the whole Princeton connection. And you know, I'm kind of, you know, so by 90, though, I, uh, I knew better. And I voted for a, I voted for a Christy Whitman, and I was excited to see she came in close. But I wasn't here for the Senate race. The, uh, the uh, next race, though, the governor's race, interesting thing, Eagleton played a huge part in that for me because um, between uh, working at the National Endowment for the Arts and uh, coming back to school, I worked for then Assemblyman Leonard Lance. I was his first legislative director. And through Leonard, I had met uh, Governor Whitman. Uh, she had had some fundraisers. They obviously had known each other since they were uh, children. His father was Wes Lance, the senator and the judge, and um, very involved in Republican politics. And of course, her parents were uh, the Todds, and they were very involved on a state and national level. And they were all hunted in county. So I'd gone to a fundraiser for Governor Whitman with Leonard, where I got to meet Richard Nixon. And uh -huh. I still have a picture with Richard Nixon. It was pretty cool. <laughs> he was extremely brilliant, especially when he talked about baseball. <laughs> it, was, it was a great, it was so interesting. And then I was at Eagleton, and in Eagleton then, it was a one-year master's program, and your second semester, they really encouraged you to do an internship. So my internship was with the primary okay. for Governor Whitman, and I was, in, I was in the policy office on the primary. It was an extremely small policy office. And uh, it was funny because Dan Todd, the governor's brother, kept saying, well, we, really, we need to pay you. This is ridiculous. We can't just have you here working. I kept saying, no, you can't pay me, because if I get paid, I won't get course credit, and I need course credit to graduate. So. It was part of my uh, graduation, fulfilled part of my graduation requirements mm -hmm. for uh, Eagleton. So once you graduated then, did you work in the campaign? I, they rolled me right over into paid staff okay. right after I graduated, yeah. So I graduated in May and then I started you know, pretty much the next day. Uh, and this was still during the primary? Yes, during the, during the primary. So I worked from January uh, with Liz Murray, who was running the policy office. Um, forward through the primary and then we just kept on going through November and it was a very small primary office it was just Liz and me and a young man whose first name I remember Steve but I can't remember his last name we used to just call him baby wonk because yeah. everyone just called us the wonks we were the wonk office <laughs> and you know we were in there just answering any question on policy people sent us um, and setting up round tables doing other things so would you say this was your first job in politics um, no, this wasn't your first job. No. No, no. <laughs> no <laughs> so I had about seven years done. <laughs> before, so you were already experienced. So once Whitman um, became governor, mm -hmm. so we talked a little bit about her, her, her uh, the campaign. So you were the poli one of the policy people during the whole campaign. Yeah, and that was interesting because we had a lot of help from people on the outside. Um, I think in one of our other... Uh, panel discussions about Governor Whitman's office. We particularly had good help from the assembly side of the aisle. You know, the, the legislator, I was with the legislative uh, surge when we, we uh, took over the legislature. I was working for Leonard and um, it had Republican majorities in both houses for the first time in a long time. And uh, the assembly side uh, and the staff on the assembly side were extremely helpful and would, and Chuck Hitayan was extremely helpful and they would, uh, we could call them and talk to them as we put together, we were putting together these blue, blue uh, papers, these blue pages um, on things, blueprints for this, blueprint for that, and on all, every different area, environment, economics, uh, um, education and all sorts of things and uh, we worked with a lot of people and uh, we would bring people in. I remember Debbie Ports came in on an insurance uh, sit down. We had, to, what are we gonna do about insurance? And we'd, we'd have all sorts of different people um, coming in. And then there were, you know, there were people, you know, coming from all over 
adding into that. Uh, we were very much dealing not at all with the political, but with the policy. So that the, that was almost a very separate. Um, but there were other people who would kind of swing in and do a lot of policy with us. Jim Kennedy was one, I would say. Uh, and uh, the, the assembly staff people like Judy Jango, extremely helpful. And uh, during the campaign, I had raised the issue that they should really do a blueprint for the arts because Governor Florio famously cut the arts by 50% after Governor Kane had been such a huge supporter. And uh, you know that was really devastating. We lost a lot of organizations. There was a rally. It was, it was, it was a big deal. So they very nicely said, yes, you can absolutely do this. And uh, you know, I drafted something. I worked with a lot of people. What should be in it? They approved it. But they wanted to release it the Saturday before the election because of her reputation of sort of the, the whole, oh, Tom Kane and Pearls sort of thing. We, they didn't think, uh, they didn't think of a blueprint on the arts, even though I would say, and st said then and still say now, that it's a, a cr crucial for education, economic development, quality of life. You know, they said, yeah, that's good, but release it on, on Saturday. And I have to tell you that I heard from more people and more Democrats voted for her that Tuesday than you could imagine, and many of them were artists and arts organization leaders. So. Interesting. So once Governor uh, Whitman was elected, what, what job did you hold during her first term? Uh, well, during her first term, I, was a, I held two jobs simultaneously. I was a full-time speechwriter, and the first year we just had three. It was Mike Marr, who had written for Governor Kane and had been a Drew with him. Uh, Jim Gardner, who'd been a newspaper guy, I think he was with the Asbury Park Press immediately before that, and, and me. And we were, the, we were the three speech writers. And then in addition, among those three, I was the, I was the one who was split. I also was the policy advisor on um, the arts, history, tourism, the humanities. And because it was, it was a role that Jane Kenney, who was made the head of the uh, policy and planning, knew that I was uh, uh, the right person to do. Uh, otherwise, it wasn't like they were going to go out and hire a separate person to do uh, what then was a relatively small area. Um, so so you, you, had, you held two jobs simultaneously. I did. And speech writing was in policy and planning, because they, uh -huh. they had a viewpoint at the time that it was important that the policies be communicated effectively. And uh, you know, we worked. We sat in with them. and. Always sat in with them the rest of the. So the time. who were the who were the people that you worked with um, at the time? Who were the major people that you worked with? Well, Jane Kenny was right. the chief policy and planning, and Eileen McGinnis was the deputy chief. It was an interesting thing because the campaign had you know once the campaign was over, it wasn't as if the campaign staff then became the transition staff. A lot of people sort of I don't want to say swooped in, but <laughs> swooped in from other places some of whom were our supporters in the primary, some supported Carrie Edwards because they weren't, you know, because it was a, you know, a family affair, these primaries. Um, but as it went forward, you know, they were vetting and doing a lot of things. But, but they made sure, the governor, and I have to say to his credit, his, her brother and other people made sure that the people on the campaign moved over, but at the same time that we got the best talent in other areas. And we didn't have people on every, um, area. So, as uh, you know, Jane was the main person, Eileen McGinnis, then as the deputy, were people we were working with. But Ju uh, Judy Django came in for environment. One of my favorite people, Bruce Stout, came in as our crime guy, and he still is the leading expert in the state. And, and he really is a person who, with the governor, because she'd been on that board that used to be out in California that was somewhat controversial when she was running, you know, but she, he and the governor brought drug courts to New Jersey. Um, we also had uh, uh, various people in education. Um, there was a, I, my name is escaping me. Our second education person was Jackie Stevens. The first one was uh, Christy, but I can't think of her last name at the moment. <laughs> but we had uh, Liz Murray and Leslie Anderson were working on the CCC concept in the cities. Um, eventually, uh, you know, we. Uh, Eventually, we had more and more people uh, coming through, and, and law policy advisors. Some were pretty consistently uh, there, though, throughout the term. And what were the major issues? Major issues you dealt with? 
Well, as a speechwriter, we dealt with all the issues. We, we put them, you know, we, we were in a lot of meetings on what was going on and what we were dealing with and, and how to communicate, communicate it. One of the first things was the tax cut and then speeches about the tax cut. Um, and then the next, you know, the, we, we really didn't write that speech because that speech was so soon at the start of her term. But, but then, you know, almost immediately we were writing the budget speech. So budget was critical, and the governor really believed that your budget document was your biggest policy document. So that was a huge thing. And so the writing of that first budget speech, people were coming. Christy Sarche, that was the education person. And people were coming and, and, and realizing that what's going to be said in the speech is what's going to happen. And so they were kind of coming to us saying, you know what, this should be in the speech. And we had to start look, saying, uh, wait a minute, has that been signed off to be in the speech or not signed off to be in the speech? And it was funny, there was an educa higher education policy that wound up being signed off, then no, was they no go, then it was go, then it was no go. And at the end, as it turns out, I think it was no, but it was still in the speech. So it became the policy. <laughs> it had to do with grants, and we, we still jokingly call those Sarche grants. So talk about the, <laughs> the, 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 your policy area. So mm -hmm. your policy area in terms of arts and culture, mm -hmm. et cetera. So talk, talk to me about okay. the major issues in that area. Well, as you know, the budget and uh, the economy was kind of slow in the first year because uh, we had we'd been coming off the recessions of the early 90s. And in the blueprint for the arts, we laid out a bunch of things that we wanted to do. One was to slowly, gradually build the Arts Council budget back up again. But that first couple years wasn't really the place. But what we did do is guarantee that it wasn't reduced any. So that first year it wasn't reduced. And then eventually it did get up to $20 million by 2000. And she did jump out in front of the legislature, even though Treasury was, was ticked at me. <laughs> and I, I made the case to the governor because they said, we never say what we're going to do before we do it. I made the case to her, the legislature's going there. They've been, they'd been doing it, doing it, doing it. Leonard was still in the legislature. He was a big proponent. I said, you might as well jump out in front of the parade in this, because we're going to agree. We, we agree with it on all means, so might as well do it that way. The um, other things, that, the first things we did was that um, economic plan. And uh, I, was, I was working with the um, Tourism and Gaming Committee, and I asked that we create a subcommittee on the arts, history, and humanities. So I was able to bring together the head of the Arts Council, the head of the Humanities Council, and um, the head of the Historic Trust sat in on that. And they really didn't work much together. So this was bringing them together, and we put together plans of things we were going to, to do uh, moving forward. A um, couple of things that I wanted to jump in on right away was, uh, one was the PAC, the New Jersey PAC, because we hadn't finalized uh, the fact that it, the state was going to spend the $180 million. And so that was uh, top on my list. The other was to get Morvan back on track again, because uh, the previous administration had stopped the um, restoration of Morvan. So we, we, uh, that was on my list. And Jane used to laugh and say, I should just have a stamp that says, oh, by the way, don't forget we have to fix Morvan, because I would keep sending her these little memos. By the way, we should be looking at this and that. So there were a lot of issues that had come up, and also how to get tourism um, reconnected to the arts and history. And I had the pleasure when I was a speechwriter, and I wrote speeches up until I became acting secretary in uh, July of 98. Um, I had the pleasure of writing the tourism speech every year. So that was great. My first tourism speech is still my favorite. And in it, I was trying to lay out a, a policy direction for tourism with the governor on, uh, you know, that we need to not just promote the shore, but look at our interior western uh, parts of the state and all the great arts and history and culture that we have to offer in the rest of New Jersey and beauty, natural beauty. and. Um, you know, something about a line, have you ever, you know, taken a wrong turn and gotten lost in the most beautiful place you've ever seen? You know, this, that's what New Jersey is to a lot of us. So um, we were laying out how we were going to try to move forward on tourism and other things. So will you, you had a great deal to do with the creation, establishment, and administration of the Cultural Trust. <laughs> so will you spend some time in telling us about it and how that came to be? Yeah, the cultural trust is is something that you know I'm very proud of, and I know uh, Leonard's very proud of as he sponsored the bill. Uh, the The cultural trust actually sprang out of an idea that started when Governor Florio cut the funding for the arts by 50 percent because 
in the early 90s, they started having conferences. What can we do with the, with the downturn, the recession? Every state was looking at this, and some states were coming up with creative ideas. I remember Missouri was really out in front on this. And um, we had a, we had a uh, uh, the Arts Council hosted a um, conference, and the conference had people from a lot of different states, including Missouri and some other states. And uh, one of the things, trusts were, were one of the big issues. And we figured if we had a cultural trust, it wasn't to do the operating support, but to do all the other things that we weren't able to do. In the Kane administration, there had been a bond act for capital. We haven't had capital funding for the arts since that uh, 87 bond act. Um, so the cultural trust sprang of that, came through the 90s. We worked on it. When I was a policy advisor, we, we, we worked a little bit with it. And then uh, when I was acting secretary, you know, it was something we were able to try to put together better. But in the meanwhile, you had the people from the outside who wanted it, the cultural groups, organizations, Art Pride, you know, really had done a lot on that. They co-hosted that conference. And then you had Josh Weston coming from the other side as a donor and someone who was very, um, very interested in the health, long-term health of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, Liberty Science Center, the New Jersey Symphony. He had an idea that we should come in and create something that would ensure that those institutions would survive and flourish no matter what. And uh, Just let me interrupt you. Josh Weston, the former CEO of ADP. Yes, correct. The former CEO of ADP. And, and his idea coming through that we just want to support these other groups and then our pride and the other organizations groups and, and uh, that we wanted to um, you know, help all groups with, with this and, and maybe work on an endowment concept. And then from internally, we all said, you know what, we don't want to do something just for arts and not do it for history, because history did not uh, come along with the arts in the 80s. For some reason, they, they just didn't have the same, um, they didn't get the same benefits out of, out of the 80s as the, that the arts did. So they were much less funded. And we wanted to make sure this was something that would bring the arts, history, and humanities together. So with uh, Josh's idea from here, sort of an outside, and then the internal groups. If you ever read Kingdon's book on agenda setting and policy, it's like the different groups that come in um, that make something happen, and then the policy window opens, and you can, you can quickly go through it if you're ready to move. So even though the cultural trust would seem like it was the fastest piece of legislation that ever threw, flew through the legislature, um, it actually was almost 10 years in the making by the time the window opened and we were able to do it. And it was interesting because it qual called for 10 million annually for 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get all of that because uh, you know, the administration's changed. But um, Leonard introduced that bill probably in March. And Treasury didn't bother to fight it that much because they didn't think it would pass. And then it did. <laughs> it flew through. He got it through the Assembly. He got it through the Senate. It passed, she signed it in July of 2000. And with that, we had arranged working uh, with David Grant at the Dodge Foundation that the Dodge Foundation would be the first um, uh, foundation to contribute to, to the trust. And the trust is a public-private partnership. So they, w at the bill signing, they gave Governor Whitman a check for a million dollars to start the trust. So the trust now has um, between about $22 million in it. I, in 2000, after she signed the legislation, we started, uh, she started appointing the board. She, I was happy to say I was the first appointment. Josh was probably next. <laughs> and uh, she, by 2001, we were having our first meetings. Um, Judy Dawkins uh, was, was our first chair. Then she and Josh became co-chairs pretty quickly. And uh, then Josh chaired for about the next 10 years while I was vice chair. And then when Josh left, I became chair. And then I was offered this job and had to step off the trust, but I sit ex officio on the trust for the Secretary of State, who is also the Lieutenant Governor. And, uh, you know, I, it's, I still uh, stay very close right. to the trust. <laughs> they promised me that when I left the administration, they would reappoint me to the trust, so we'll see. Yes. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll hold them to that, Nancy. <laughs> now, in, your, in Governor Whitman's second term, you became Acting Secretary of State. Yes. How long did you serve in that position, and what were your responsibilities? Uh, a little more than six months. And uh, I started July 1, and I was finished, I don't know, January 4th mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, to run the department, at the time it was a bigger than it is now even, but um, the cultural agencies were brought into the Department of State under Jane Burgio. Um, most of them are there. 
not all of them, the SHPO officers and DP, then the Historic Trust is in DCA still, but um, the Arts Council, the State Museum, the Archives, the Historical Commission, and the Cultural Trust are all within the Department of State. And uh, it was it was a good and interesting uh, time period. I had just had my, my son was a year old, my older son. So, you know, I was busy. I had two children during the Women Administration. So um, it was cute to see him on the floor of the uh, office, you know, rolling, rolling things around <laughs> and playing. But uh, running the department, which was a bigger job than um, just uh, advising them over time. Uh, I was amazed at how much the Secretary of State is required to sign pilot's licenses, you know, um, <laughs> riverboat, captain like tugboat licenses. I, I had a stack every day, I had so much signing to do by hand. We signed the bonds that when a bond is finished and comes due, you get, um, you sign them. And they're beautiful. The artwork on the bonds are gorgeous. And I signed one that, uh, I think Governor Hughes was the other signer on, and I was just I was just thrilled, loving history. I thought this is so neat, and I looked at the guy and said, "Oh, so when you catch this, can I keep this?" <laughs> he said to me, "No, no, no, you cannot." I I found extradition papers or something. Apparently, the Secretary of State has to sign off on. There was um, uh, one case where uh, you know they had this extradition papers they wanted me to sign. Someone from Council's office, who I guess just did this. And she didn't want me to see what I was going to be signing. And I said, well, I won't sign that without seeing it. And it turned out to be a pretty controversial figure. They were trying to figure out how to um, extradite who was away from where she usually was. And uh, you know, it didn't work. But still, the Secretary of State signed stuff like that. Who, who knew there are so many small constitutional things like that. And at the same time, when you're Secretary of State, you're expected to be out um, at events out in public, um, you know, cutting ribbons and, and talking to arts groups and um, working on a lot of different uh, uh, items. And that way, it's a very public role as well. So, um, you know, it had a lot of policy things going on and a lot of uh, detail paperwork things. And then you have all the usual civil service di division directors issues, office issues that you have to deal with. But it was also a very fertile time for us in two areas, opening, getting doing some work behind the scenes to get the archives opened, which was Bob Littell, Senator Littell's uh, baby, his project over the years. And, and that's the building I work in now, 225 West State Street. So working hard behind the scenes to get some of the last little details there, working to get Morven, get the, the shovel in the ground at Morven. And there was one little holdup that uh, you know they wanted uh, there was a contingency fee that Treasury said, well, you, you know, oh, yes, you've, you've raised all the money, friends of Historic Morgan. Good for you. You've raised that money. Oh, but we can't do it because you don't have, you need another 50000 to contingency fee to do this. So um, much to their dismay, I called the governor and said, this is what's holding this up. And, you know, I have talked to them and they just won't budge, you know, and I call and uh, she wound up calling them up saying and doing it and the treasurer was not happy with me. Uh, and then in the other very fertile period there to work on the cultural trust because uh, I was over there and we were able to really um, put together more what we thought it was going to look like. So, Who were the major people that you worked with at the time as Secretary of State? Well, uh, Barbara Moran, who is the uh, Executive Director of the Arts Council and later was the first Executive Director of the Cultural Trust. Um, Mark Mappin was the head of the Historical Commission. I think Mark was head of the Historical Commission then, but there were still a lot of other people there, like Giles Wright, Dick Waldron had been there, um, a lot of people there, Sarah Curitan eventually. Um, the head of the museum was Leah Sloshberg, and I'd known Leah since the Kane administration, so uh, Leah. And uh, Carl Nieder was the archivist, and his uh, deputy was Joe Klett, who's now the archivist. Uh, so we did a lot of work with did a lot of work with all of them, and then there was also the elections folks and uh, assistant secretary um, was Lauren Robinson Brown. Um, so it was uh, it was uh, a good a good group of people, and you know, department was a little bigger. When so when you were in both roles in um, both the secretary of state and then in policy. What would you say that Governor Whitman's objectives were in these areas? She saw the benefit of making the arts and history um, 
putting them in service to the rest of the state. And she saw how they could be an engine of economic development. She, she, she signed off on the PAC because she thought it could do uh, everything that it has done in Newark, if you've been to that area. There used to be methadone clinics there, and now that is the nice, you know, beautiful area of, of Newark, and it's a destination for sure. Um, I think she also appreciated the arts and history on their own sake and, and that it was important that we preserve our historic sites for the future. Um, just the way with the, one of the things I did most did with the, was with the Garden State Preservation Trust. Um, that was something we worked on from policy and planning and uh, Maureen Ogden had been the head of the commission that said we should go for a million acres. And, Leonard had, had been working on that, was in that group, and the two of them agreed that we should fund the historic trust through that too. And there was some pushback. The environmentalists, they don't, they don't like to share too much of their money. So, so they were getting $2.8 billion, and they, they carved out $6 million a year for 10 years for the historic trust. So we were getting 60 for the for the buildings that were on a lot of the uh, those that land that they were preserving. And, uh, and uh, so that, that went through to be a ballot issue, I think, while I was still policy and planning. But then when I jumped over to uh, being the acting secretary, Art Brown, who was the Ag Commissioner, and Bob Shin, who was the DEP Commissioner, and I would go a lot of places together, the three of us, and talk about um, why we need to do this. And I remember we went to Washington Rock Road in Wachung where Washington surveyed the troops, but it was a lot of, you know, there's a great environmental area. And um, then we went, we were up in Fort Lee, you know, the same thing, talking about why it was important for farming, why it was important for the uh, open space, and why it was important for history. And we went around the state doing, you know, like what we call a dog and pony show, but we uh, were happy to see that that bond issue passed by overwhelming uh, numbers. Terrific. So did Governor Whitman make a difference as a woman um, and for women from your perspective? Yeah, I really think she did. Um, I, I think, uh, one, it was just the example she set for young women coming up. I think that was tremendous. But another was how many women she had in her administration, which to hear the, some of the people in the legislature describe it, to can believe how many women there could be. But when you realize that there were so many men before, <laughs> and the women are more than 50% of the population, it probably wasn't even 50% uh, most of the time. But she did not, she did not uh, care if you were male or female. But on the bright side of that, so she hired a lot of women who maybe not necessarily wouldn't have gotten the chance before. And um, she hired a lot of women in first positions, first woman ever to do this, to do that. Uh, you know, first, first woman chief of staff, first woman AG, first woman Supreme Court uh, chief justice. I mean, she, she, she put a lot of women uh, in role model positions, which I think is important. But I think she also, it just also brought a different perspective. And working for her was, was a really a, a great thing because she understood that people had to balance their lives and their work and that, you know, she didn't want people working 20 hours a day. She didn't think good decisions would be made that way. <laughs> and I think that's true. <laughs> Um, so you answered this a little, but did it, my question was, did it affect who held power inside and outside the administration? So clearly what you've, you've just said is there were a lot of firsts. There were, and I actually think she had an impact outside the administration because in the past you would see people coming into the governor's office or be a group of men coming in to talk to the governor. Um, you know, when I have a little experience because I'm on my fourth governor now, Governor Wynn was my second governor. People seem to bring a woman along, you know? And I think women in companies and corporations got to go places they necessarily may not have if she hadn't been the governor. And you'd be surprised at some of the things, especially on the campaign, that we would hear about women, run, you know, a woman can't run the government. I mean, it was really as if it was the 1950s, and, um, except without the polite 1950s language. <laughs> Um, do you think you face different expectations because the governor was a woman? Uh, no, I, I really don't think once she became governor, I think, I, I don't think it was different expectations. I think um, she really expected you to be prepared, to know your stuff, not to, you know, not just be a hail fellow, well met, you know, sort of 
uh, political type, she wanted you to know your policy and know it inside and out and keep her um, informed. And she really was interested in policy. She herself would admit to being a closet policy wonk, and she was really interested in the details of policy and would sit and we would talk a long time about you know what the right course was to do and and we'd do a lot of memos and a lot of back and forth and and I remember writing a half page memo once because the library association talked to me and they were talking about the terrible condition the law libraries were in they really needed a capital bond and so I wrote half a page and I said you know they're really this they've come to me this is what they want if the money's there it seems like good they'd like 40 million dollars so then she just signed off, OK, CTW. And I came down to, to Eileen, I guess, was the chief at the time, and said, wait, wait, if I could have had $40 million for anything, I might have picked something else. But this is good. But could I also have so could some of that go over here? She said, nope, that was it. $40 million, that's your. that's what you get. <laughs> From your perspective, what were Governor Whitman's greatest strengths? Well, one is that. She, you know, she had a, a quick mind and she was willing to do the hard work and study and, and was interested, really interested in policy, which I think comes from really being interested in people. And um, she, had a, she had a lot of charisma. People would meet her and they would really uh, be impressed. Like they, they didn't expect her to be warm and have, have that sort of charisma. But at the same time, she was very good about being private of a lot of the um, really nice things she was doing for people and individuals without blowing her own horn about it. She wasn't, um, she didn't seem like she was always angling for, you know, the next better thing. She, she really um, was in the moment. Uh, but she, she really, she also really didn't say, well, you know, I'm only interested in the environment. I only want to work on that. She, she, wanted, she wanted to make sure everything was covered. She was uh, really thorough. And I think that's what made our policy office really such a great um, high-functioning office is that Everything was, was somebody had a, a horse in the race in every issue and knew something about every issue and were able to, to come out and, and uh, address it. And she really thought, well, everything is connected. I think she saw the interconnectedness of everything and that if we do this, it will help this, which will help this, which will help this. And that's why it was so important to her that she had an office that, that worked like that. And what would you say were her greatest accomplishments as governor? Well, I think she would say, most people would say the million acres was probably huge. Any state in New Jersey with this, the, the history of sprawl in the 80s had so much sprawl. Um, so important, I think. Uh, that was such a huge uh, piece of it. But at the same time, she did some great things in education. For the arts, she brought us back into a, into a really uh, good place. And uh, uh, the same thing with the cultural trust was huge for us. But, but um, Drug courts were probably high up on her list. Uh, she did a lot in law enforcement. She did a lot in the law enforcement area. Um, and when she did a lot in human services, too, which is more complicated, more group homes. And um, there were some legislators who were very interested in that. And, and you know, she really was trying to chip away at that list and, and deinstitutionalization. A couple, I think she closed a few places. and. Um, you know, I, I think she she uh, she did a lot. I I, I think she had the ba budget balance really well, despite all the I think uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. When she left, the pension was fully funded. People forget that she tried to do something by investing the pension, which Treasury was very keen on. Not everyone thought it was a great idea, but it was an effort to try to improve the pension system, not to just raid the pension system. And when she left, she also left the budget with a billion dollar surplus. Um, you know, I think she would say her biggest problem was she probably shouldn't have left that last year. <laughs> Bad things can happen. So, th so which leads me to, to the next question. What do you think were her most significant weaknesses? Well, well, you know, one, she likes she's she has a, a competitive, and um, um, athletic and um, action uh, spirit, where she wants to be moving and doing new things. And maybe the biggest problem was after seven years, she'd sort of hit the wall on her learning curve, and then that's why she wanted a new uh, adventure, a new new something to learn in D.C. And that that was probably the biggest 
problem that she she uh, should stay put one more year, and I think uh, you know people would be speaking much more fondly of her, and they really should be because she really did a lot of uh, tremendous things. And um, you know, I can see after seven years, it does get to be a grind. But uh, you know, I think that would probably be uh, you know our our. Uh, biggest problem is she should have served that last year out and we would have had an incredible year for her from the arts. They were going to uh, set her everywhere and uh, really throw parties in her honor for all the things that she had done and just the way they had done for Governor Kane that it was it's really uh, uh, you know would have been a nice year to take a bow on uh, some of the things that she had done and then I think they would be more firmly set in people's minds. Can you um, elicit for us any of her, and were there any significant failures? Oh yeah, the auto insurance <laughs> reboot, that was, uh, that was uh, during 97. Since uh, uh, then candidate McGreevy only said two things ever. Um, I'm going to, uh, one of them was I'm going to fix auto insurance. Governor Whitman, because of her competitive nature said, Oh, we got to go at him on auto insurance. And some of us, <laughs> she may recall, said, no, no, don't do that. Let's just talk about our strengths. Let's not, you know, play to what he wants to play into. So that meant, and, and I was still speech writing. So the, we speech writers sat down with all these insurance. We had a table full of insurance people from the insurance department, you know, good intentioned, you know, very knowledgeable in their, their uh, areas. But they said, all right, let's. This is what we think you should do. It was unexplainable. <laughs> you could not explain this at all. It was just, you know, we kept saying, well, why don't we just eliminate auto insurance like New Hampshire and see how the chips fall? This was, it was, it was, uh, it did not go anywhere. It was not a, uh, a successful reboot of auto insurance. And then the other issue would be the Pension Bond Act. It was, it was well intentioned, but. Um, you know, <laughs> it wasn't. It turned out it was not the not a good move to make. Now we had that other panel here in Treasury. The Treasury people still say that was the right move to make. You know, having worked for Leonard, who was not a fan of the Pension Bond Act, you know, I, I agree. I, there were some of us inside and other people who said, you know, this for the speech writing office again. It was unexplainable. We could not explain it. And I found over the course of the four and a half years writing a speech and even, you know, doing policy. If you can't explain it, then it probably isn't great because <laughs> it's too complicated to get across. You're never going to sell it. But at the same time, it probably is too complicated to work. So that, that seemed to be the problem. It wasn't for want of wanting to do the right thing and wanting to come up with a really clever, innovative solution, because I think that was the goal of both the auto insurance and the pension bond. I think that was the goal. So, you know, but sometimes, you know, you can't hit a ball out of the park. <laughs> now, how, do, how would you assess her administration as a whole when you look back on the entire seven years? Well, I'm obviously biased, but I think it was a very good seven years. I think a lot was accomplished. Uh, each of the departments, she gave everybody in the departments enough um, enough leeway to really try to come up with creative ideas she, and, and to do things. And she also was very determined that once they had come to her and, and she signed off on something, that if it didn't go well, she backed them up. She would say, no, no, this was not my department going off the rails. I'm behind this. I take responsibility for this. And I, I think that was really refreshing. Um, now, if they did go off the rails without checking in or anything, you know, then she might uh, say, hey, <laughs> what, what you doing? <laughs> but, you know, she, if she agreed on something, a decision, and it didn't go well, she stood by it. And I think, uh, you know, that made the cabinet members and the staff and all of us on the staff feel like we were supported all the way through. And, and I really think everybody just uh, worked their, their hardest because everybody really believed in what they were doing and what she was doing, just like on the campaign. There was such a belief among a lot of the of the women working in the campaign and women outside on the campaign. I know you've interviewed many of them who it was really meaningful and important to uh, to put a woman governor in, to, and and she was she was the perfect person to to do that. So, did you experience yourself as part of a historic change? Well, it's hard to say while you're in it. Well, this is a historic change, but clearly, since history was my area, right. since history was my area. 
And I knew what was going to happen 50 years from now when they were, when there were the meetings would devolve into, you know, well, what is she going to be remembered for? We want to make sure this is her historic letter. I said, no, there's going to be a tour guide. There are going to be all these portraits of men. Then there's going to be a woman, and then there are women. They're going to say she was the first woman governor. And that, that is why it's important and why she did go to such a degree. She went out and spoke to girls' groups and women's groups all the time, and she really went out and inspired people. And it's important, although, you know, she may not say it's her most important legacy in a lot of ways. Um, just the very start of it was important. And then to be reelected um, is sensational. I've looked through Eagleton's list of women governors, and I'm not sure there are too many who've been reelected. Once Governor Whitman left office, what happened to the changes in policy and personnel that had occurred in her administration? Well, it depends. Um, you know, some of the policies were were constitutional, like the million acres, and, and others are were more ephemeral. But that's the way it is in any any uh, administration. You can't set everything in stone, but a lot of it. You know, government keeps rolling along, and, and a lot of it um, stayed uh, stayed the course. And a lot of the same people stay in administrations. Not in her own office. We all had to, to skedaddle. And uh, that's true most of the time in the cabinet. But there are a lot of good people who stay in or near government, like Jennifer Velez, you saw, just lasted over several administrations. And she was with Human Services. She'd done that kind of work for Governor Whitman. And, and uh, you know, people, people find a way to stay involved in the policy issues that they're interested in. I left, um, left and went to graduate school, but I immediately joined the Art Pride Board, and I stayed on the Cultural Trust. So people that she put on boards and commissions were able to help shepherd things uh, that they were doing. Um, so, you know, there's always, there's always a li little bit of slippage and some things that stick, and hopefully it's the best of the things that stick that... Uh, go go forward. Now you've continued to have a very interesting career since the Whitman administration. Uh, please tell us about it. Well, let's see. I said I went to graduate school, and during that time, I did a little sideline speech writing, and I popped into NJN and helped them during a transition uh, when their foundation director stepped down. Um, I did a little work there. I worked helped Governor Whitman a little bit on. Uh, just on the chapter on being the first woman governor on her book, uh, though she really took that over and just, she didn't want to write that chapter. <laughs> and uh, Bob Bostock, who also uh, worked on the book with the governors, said, yeah, she doesn't want to do the chapter. But when we came in, we wound up talking for hours. And um, I wrote a draft, and she really uh, warmed to working on the draft. So uh, uh, that was a great experience. Um, and then I worked at Leadership New Jersey for four years. I was a seminar director. And that was great because it allowed me to keep my hand in on all the policies. I wrote basically a 15 to 20 page paper every month on um, all the different policy areas that uh, we would do. We would take them to Camden to study education. We would go, come to Trenton to do politics. We would go to uh, New Brunswick to do health care and Patterson to do human services. And I switched it so we were going to Newark to do the arts. And uh, in June, we would go to New Jersey State Prison and <laughs> take them through and do corrections. and. Uh, you know, there were environment, we go canoeing through the Pinelands and to Atlantic City, and there were all sorts of interesting um, topics. I did that for four years, and that was a, a really good experience. Um, then I graduated, and uh, I was going to teach. I had something lined up at, at a university, and uh, I was invited to join the Christie administration about two years in, I, I, April 2012. I came back to the Department of State, of all places, and I'm uh, working on the arts and history. And what's your position there now? I'm the Assistant Secretary of State, and my portfolio are the uh, cultural divisions in the department. Great. Is there anything else about the Whitman administration that we may not have asked that you'd like to tell us? Let's see, very dog friendly. <laughs> 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 on the campaign, I'll never forget, because we always believed in our heart that when push came to shove, people were going to go into that booth, and they were not going to be able to pull the lever uh, for Jim Flora. They were going to vote for, for Christy Whitman. We just, we just felt it, you know, and, and maybe we were naive, but we just felt this in our heart that it was going to happen. Uh, but, but come election, and you know, the Eagleton had the, her nine points down on Saturday. Our internal polling had her much closer, neck and neck, Sunday night, and trending her way. So 
um, sat Tuesday of Election Day, I remember a big issue erupted about this dog, Tara the dog, who had bitten somebody. And, uh, and uh, uh, she was out on the road on her campaign bus. Someone had actually given her a puppy on these travels, and she took it. <laughs> took the puppy. And um, people were calling in, and at this point, you know, you're exhausted. You're, we've been working 24-7 for a long time. And we were just, you know, normally we always checked on policy. We just said to these people on the phone, Liz and I looked at each other and said, she's saving that dog. There's no way that dog is going, is going down. If, go, if she becomes governor, she will save that dog. And you know what? She did save that dog. We didn't have to check. That dog went to a farm in Connecticut. And uh, I don't know how, what's eventual end, but, you know, we knew she, went, she would save That's that right. dog. But it was so, it was so funny because uh, uh, it just all of that um, just sort of uh, piled up. I remember there was an article early in the administration um, about her kitty core of people who helped her. She had all these young people working on it. And it was her advanced people and her schedulers and all these other people, five or six people you know. But they were all talking about people in their 20s. But funny, Liz and I were in our 20s, but we were not, on that. We were not included in that. Because somehow I don't think we, we were considered in that grouping somehow. <laughs> Maybe it's because we were policy people. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was enough distance for us from, uh, in our work careers, I guess, that it, we weren't considered that, which was funny. Um, but I think, I think the Whitman administration was a very, uh, also a very family-friendly administration. People really knew each other. People really got along well. It wasn't all sunshine and roses. There was a lot of, you know, like all administrations, especially the first year, there's a lot of jockeying for position. But by the end, it ran extremely smoothly. You know, I, I would say that, you know, the last two years were so smooth. Um, everybody in the chief's positions all ran along smoothly. The cabinet went along smoothly. Everyone knew what's expected of them. Um, so, you know, it was, I think it was a really uh, a great time in New Jersey. And we were fortunate with the other things going on in the country, economically and everything else, that, that uh, it, it was a good time.